Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I'm still on vacation. Moreover, I am cooling off a bit because I'm uh, in the Tahoe Truckee River. That is the river that leads out of Lake Tahoe. Uh, it's uh, back there, there's like a dam that controls the uh, height of the lake. In 1910, they wanted the lake to store more water, so they built a dam and raised it, the water depth, by about six foot, adding more storage during the uh, you know, summer or whatever. Very important in California. Incidentally, Tahoe uh, comes from the Native American, the local Native American language, where the word ta where Tahoe literally meant the lake. So Lake Tahoe is Lake the Lake. Anyway, today's rocket science subject is the Delta III. And we all know the Delta II, much beloved by NASA, very reliable launch vehicle. We know the Delta IV, much beloved by the military, and able to launch bigger payloads than almost any other US rocket right now. But the Delta III is unfortunately the long, uh, you know, it's the red-headed stepchild of the Delta family, unfortunately. So the story behind the Delta III was that back in the mid-90s, there were greater and greater payloads being demanded by the launch market. So McDonnell Douglas, the makers of the Delta II, took a look at what they had and said, can we make it better and bigger? And what they did was they uh, changed the first stage a bit so that they took the, the, uh, the fuel tank, they took the, the oxygen tank remained the same width, but the fuel tank, they actually fattened it up and shortened it. Then on top of that, that allowed them to add a huge wide fat uh, payload fairing. And their second stage, they replaced the Delta's uh, AJ-10 propelled, um, you know, hypergolic fueled stage with a high energy hydrogen oxygen stage that was uh, propelled by an R RL-10 engine. Of course, expander cycle hydrogen oxygen engine. Very, very reliable engine. Also, they took the existing strap-on boosters that the Delta II was using and they replaced them with nine bigger and better boosters. And because this rocket was going to be a bit heavier, they thought that it would be good to give it a bit more control authority. So three of those nine boosters would get um, vectoring nozzles, so they would be able to control the rocket a little. Uh, another change that, well, another interesting change, I guess, or another interesting feature of the nine would, would be that only six of them would be lit at launch to provide extra boost, and then later three more of them would be lit up as they got further uh, downrange. So yeah, given that the Delta II had been so incredibly reliable, they were, it was quite easy for them to actually get launch contracts, and Hughes Corporation came forth with a Galaxy X satellite uh, for their very first launch. And of course, with much fanfare, it left from Cape Canaveral and, uh, yeah, went out of control about 60 seconds into the launch. And in, well, the, uh, looking at the post, the play-by-play -play afterwards, they noticed that uh, the rocket had gone into this oscillating roll. It started rolling one way and then it would quickly roll the other way and it would wobble back and forth, right? I'm sure, you know... <laughs> I'm sure they didn't have to deal with uh, the sound of motorbikes in the background. Yeah, so what they'd done was they'd reused a lot of the guidance software for the Delta II, but of course now with more control authority, with those uh, strap-on boosters, you know, they hadn't quite got everything right. And those boosters, they would roll it one way, then they would roll it hard the other way. And every time they did that, they had to move their thrust vectoring nozzle. And that meant that they used up a little bit of their limited supply of hydraulic fluid because these were expendable boosters they didn't have a closed cycle hydraulic system right they had an open cycle system and once they ran out of hydraulic fluid those uh, thrust vectoring nozzles just froze where they are and the rocket could no longer be controlled if you played Kerbal Space Program of course you might have run into this where you build some sort of design and SAS is unable to hold it in a steady orientation and kind of wobbles back and forth it's a very similar problem and it uh, probably could have been dealt with if they'd done a bit more simulation. So yeah, first launch wasn't that great. Second launch, well, second launch went great right up until the ignition of the second stage and that amazingly reliable RL-10 engine had one of its very rare failures. It was a real tragedy because like RL-10 has been great, but second launch, yeah, they lost the satellite again. Third launch, well, by that point, Hughes Corporation was not trusting them with any more hardware, so they put a dummy satellite out, launched it into its payload orbit, and it mostly got there. But by that point, 
the commercial satellite market was kind of weakening. I mean, Russia was coming in and really being able to do a lot of commercial stuff because they were cheap. So, yeah, the Delta Three just couldn't find any uh, market and McDonnell Douglas shut down the project. Boeing would eventually, of course, acquire McDonnell Douglas and the, like, the only bit that's left in, is in the Boeing logo these days. And, of course, Boeing would later develop the Delta IV, which shared very little with previous Delta rockets. What it did bring was the fairing, and it brought the Delta cryogenic upper stage from the Delta III. Uh, the Delta IV, of course, was used by the military a lot, whereas the Delta II continued to be used by NASA, and we're going to see the last Delta II launch very soon. And Delta IV is probably going to stop launching whenever Vulcan comes online. But, yeah, that's what happened to Delta III. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.